So we do have some key updates when it comes to the Idaho 4 case. Now, if you saw one of my last videos, I spoke about with Brian Koberger's alibi, specific Isity. which is where they need specific things from the defense. And this is in regards to an alibi. In Idaho, when you're providing an alibi, you need to be able to somewhat verify a place or places or a witness or witnesses to also corroborate this story. And Brian Koberger and his defense team tiptoed along the line with this because what it is that they're looking for is a specific place as well as a witness. Now, Brian Koberger hasn't really given them a specific place and Brian Koberger hasn't really given them a witness. What he's done here is given them a brief location. Then he's using his expert to to testify for him as a witness, meaning that he's kind of given them a place as well as a witness. But is it enough? And it would seem like the prosecution are not having this one. And that's because in their eyes, this alibi doesn't justify where Brian Koberger is at the times when these crimes are believed to be committed. He's told us where he was at 2.47 a.m. as well as where his phone is just before it turns off, but then can't conclusively give us any other data as to what his whereabouts are after his phone turns off. All, all they have is CCTV as well as DNA. Now, for a long time, the defense have been talking about this DNA that they need from the prosecution. And I'm finally glad that we're getting some answers with it because again, it is actually something that I've said is more than likely the case, which has now turned out to be the case. So really quickly, when it comes to unidentified male DNA, the unidentified male DNA doesn't mean that there's loads of individuals at that house. The unidentified male DNA could be Brian's. It's just there isn't enough of a genetic structure in that DNA for them to be able to compare it to anything or anyone. The DNA in itself just isn't strong enough. Normally you need about 500 picograms or roughly around 80 cells for them to be able to do anything when it comes to DNA. And in a pinprick of blood, there are thousands of blood cells, meaning that whatever this DNA is just is insufficient for them to be able to use to do anything with. It doesn't mean that there was three or two other individuals there. This DNA could be Brian's. It's just that it's not strong enough to be able to match it to the DNA that was found on the knife sheath or anyone else's DNA in general. And I think that people are mixing the two together. The defense don't want that DNA. The defense want the DNA evidence from the FBI public, which is exactly what I've said is more than likely happening because I noticed in court proceedings that the prosecution had said that they had given given over the defense everything that they have and could, meaning that they've given over everything from their side. The FBI is kind of like a third party involvement and it's down to the FBI to give over this evidence to them. And this is merely just pushing them in the direction of finally being able to see what it was that they did or how it was that they came to get that biological imprint of Brian Koberger's and match it to him, slash match it to his family tree through genealogy. So Koberger's attorneys are requesting that forensic genetic genealogy records used by the FBI to identify Koberger as a suspect are made public. And the defense is now petitioning the judge to have most of the genetic genealogy records unsealed. Then the prosecution has asked the judge to put limitations on the defense's alibi. And it's almost like an embarrassing thing for the prosecution to even have to write to the defense. The prosecution is asking in a written response for the judge to clearly define Koberger's alibi so they know what the claims they must refute. Koberger's alibi also makes reference to the location of his cell phone at the time of murders. But I believe in this case, Case, this is going to be like an enhanced Alec Murdoch. Alec Murdoch claimed to be asleep near the house when the crimes took place, where his wife and his son were shot dead. He claimed that he couldn't have been there because he was in the house asleep, so on and forth. There was a huge thing about Alec Murdoch's alibi. Prosecution kind of just let him come in and state that that was what he was doing, because they knew that they were about to play that Snapchat. And that Snapchat was from his son's phone, which clearly showed that Alec Murdoch was not asleep in the house like he claimed, and was actually with them just before the time that the murders occurred. And I feel like we'll have an enhanced version of that here. We're not getting specifics to the alibi. And the prosecution themselves are literally having to ask the judge to clearly define what his alibi even is. And this has taken months for us to get, by the way. But if he wants to say that his phone is somewhere else at the time when his DNA clearly is at the scene of a crime, as well as CCTV evidence from multiple angles, then I wish him all the best with that one because it's going to be hard to refute. As well as all the information that they have that we know nothing about yet. You have to remember, right? We know nothing about the case. That's literally the thing here. Can you actually, if you think about it, imagine what this prosecution have for them to go for this kind of case as confidently as they are with as many agents involved as they have? FBI, state troopers, Moscow Police Department. Having one individual from one force like Moscow Police Department go around and then have all witnesses 
witnesses start to change their story. There's multiple different teams and multiple different agencies, some of which are third party, that have no reason to be involved in any way, shape or form, a cover up to this extent to help someone they don't know in a police force that they're not a part of. And the prosecution stated that this information does not rise to the level of an alibi at the time of the homicides because the defendant's cell phone stopped reporting to the cellular network before the homicides and continued to not report until after the homicides, Thompson wrote. The location of the defendant's cell phone at the times other than that time of the homicides is not proof of or relevant to the defendant's specific location at the time of the homicides. Thompson argued that the amount of time given to offer more witnesses and information is making the prosecution compromised in its ability to investigate and respond to new or additional alibi related disclosures. Basically meaning that obviously they're pushing it right out with this alibi to a point where they're literally going to be able to like give over an expert witness to something very late in the case making it a lot harder for them to kind of do anything with. Whereas the defense are asking the prosecution for everything left, right and center. Even like the genetic records from the FBI because apparently they need it as it's integral to their investigation. Not understanding that the information that they're withholding from the prosecution is also integral to the prosecution. Then the judge will determine if the upcoming pre-trial hearing is public. The judge will decide on Thursday whether to make an upcoming pre-trial hearing public. Now prosecutors want the May 14th hearing to be closed to the public but Koberger's lead public defender Ann Taylor wants this to be held in an open setting. She stated that not only is there no authority to protect the FBI, other law enforcement agencies and the state in this matter. This request to deny Mr. Koberger an open hearing is a clear violation to his right to a public trial. And fair enough that as we know the prosecution have already kind of argued this very early on and they don't want to jeopardize the informant slash witnesses or other bits of information that we do not know yet. Then we have a June hearing which may move the trial location. While the date for the trial has not yet been set, an upcoming hearing on June the 27th may actually change the trial's location. Now if you've been watching my channel for like over a year and a bit now, I literally said in the first few months that because of the publicity of this, I could see them requesting a change of venue and the place I said that they'd probably go to would be Boise and that's exactly what it looks like they're trying to push to do. But it's a bit pointless because more information about the case comes out in Boise, Idaho than it does in Moscow, Idaho. So but that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed and some of this information could help you out. Feel free to drop a comment and let me know what your thoughts are below. And if you enjoyed then feel free to like and follow for more. And if not then have a great week.